Oklahoma Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Underwriting assistance for our program is provided by the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. Today on Oklahoma Gardening, host Casey Hinches has some begonias that are as beautiful as they are tough. We look at some showy sennas that have popped up. Associate Youth Extension Specialist Shelly Mitchell talks plant relationships. We travel to the OSU Cimarron Valley Research Station in Perkins, Oklahoma for the sweet potato harvest. At the Atherton Hotel at OSU, we dig some peanuts. And Barbara Brown makes a tasty stew with the harvest. Begonias used to be one of those staple plants, especially in the shade garden. But like so many other plants, there's more and more cultivars coming on the market that allow us to push plants into kind of a different environment than what we traditionally used to use them for. Similar to coleus that used to be always in the shade and now are introduced into the sun, we also have wax begonias that we can push into the sun as well. Today we're here in the trial gardens and I always enjoy walking through the trial gardens, especially later in the season to see really what has survived when it comes to the annuals. And it was the begonias that really grabbed my attention this time walking through. And here in front of us we have one that's called Double Up. And this is a true uh, wax begonia. It's a newer cultivar and this one is the red variety. And you can see it's got its name Double Up because it has small double flowers. Now back in the day, if you were gonna push any of the wax begonias into the sun, you wanted to use the ones that had more of that bronze foliage because they didn't scorch quite as much in the sun. Now this one has been growing just fine all season long in full sun. And again, as a reminder, being in the trial gardens, basically they're planted and watered, so they really don't receive a lot of maintenance. So we kind of evaluate how well they do in a low maintenance situation. Now you can see it does have some dead flowers on it that do kind of um, sort of self-clean, but it will continue to bloom even if you don't deadhead it. Over here we have the double up pink, and you can see it has the traditional light green foliage. Again, this has been growing in full sun all season long and has done fairly well. Again, it's got the double flowers. Now if you want the white flower, this series also has a white variety available. The one that really caught my eye, however, was not a, a true wax begonia, but it's just on the way, so let's go take a look. Now the wax begonias are Begonia semperflorens, and this is Begonia benariensis. And you can see it looks like a wax begonia, but on steroids. And you probably are, can understand why it might have grabbed my attention being out here in the trial gardens. It's just a beautiful plant and has done well for us all season long. It's got huge flowers that are about an inch and a half in diameter, and you can see how many flowers it has on one cluster there. Again, it still kind of has that wax begonia look to it, but instead of the leaves being round, they're a little bit more like that angel wing begonia that has more of a, a one-sided angel wing shape to it. So while the other wax begonias are a little more compact, only getting to be about a foot tall, this one's going to get to be about 18 inches to two feet tall. It's just a beautiful example of how you can incorporate begonias into your landscape. Now this particular one is called Surefire Red, but if red's not your color, you might look for the Surefire Rose. It will have more of a bronze foliage to it and then of course a rose-colored flower. Now I know this isn't the time of year to be planting annuals as we kind of trail off and go into winter, but it's never too late to start planning for next season. I want to 
wanted to highlight another annual that's often overlooked in the springtime but really shows off a lot in the fall once it's had a nice warm season to continue growing. And that is Cassia aleda, or now it's called Senna aleda as they've changed its genus. But this is the plant behind us, commonly known as candelabra or candlestick plant. And often you buy this as an annual just in a four inch or a small one gallon pot that you can see how tall it gets, up to nine and sometimes 15 feet tall. You can see here it easily has reached nine feet behind us though. Keep in mind when you're buying this plant in the spring, you're gonna get a lot of bang for your buck. In fact, what we're looking at right here is just three little plants that were originally planted in here last spring. You wanna make sure also not to plant this at the front because it's definitely gonna get some height on it. So it makes a nice backdrop to some of your other annuals. Now this plant has very large compound leaves. As you can see, the leaflets itself get up to be about three to four inches uh, in length here. And each one of this is considered a leaf here. And these are the leaflets. Now the flowers will continue to bloom up this spike. You can see how it's been blooming for quite some time. And as you come up here, you can see that it's got several more buds to open up. But the flowers, as they open, they do look like sort of like popped corn. Now this plant should not be confused with the popcorn plant, which is another senna that we'll take a look at. So here we have another Senna or Cassia, and this one's common name is the popcorn plant. And you will undoubtedly recognize the smell when you smell and kind of rub the leaves and smell of them. It definitely smells like buttered popcorn. In fact, it'll make you want to go to the movies. But this plant is known for this fragrance, but also has a lovely flower as well. You can see it has a similar flower to the other Senna that we mentioned earlier. Um, it does look like kind of popped corn um, once those buds start to open up. But you'll notice that these buds actually have a bit of a darker look to them, whereas the others were more yellow. Also going back to the leaves, you can see that while they still have pretty long leaves, a compound leaf, the leaflets are actually much smaller and they do have a point to the tips of each one of those leaves as well. Also when you're rubbing them, you're going to notice that there's more of a velvety texture to these leaves. Now you can see this plant doesn't get quite as tall. It has a range of about six to 10 feet. Now both of these are annuals. So when you buy these in the springtime, they're definitely not gonna look like this. They're gonna need a full summer long time period to grow in order to get this established look. But just in one season, you're gonna have an annual looks this large in your garden, giving you that tropical flair. Living organisms do not live in isolation from each other. There's all kinds of interactions between plants and animals, humans and plants, humans and animals, plants and plants, all kinds of interactions. Now some interactions involve a close relationship between two things, and that's called symbiosis. And symbiosis means living together. Now, not all symbiotic relationships are helpful. Some of them are actually harmful. So in the case of a harmful relationship, you have one organism that's actually hurting, to some extent, another organism. So an example of this is mistletoe. So mistletoe is actually the state floral emblem, all right? It's the state floral emblem because in the hard winter of 1889, the only greenery to decorate graves with was mistletoe. So there's kind of a, a happy yet not happy uh, 
connection there. Now mistletoe is partially parasitic. It's a hemiparasite. It grows on trees and it gets there because birds eat the seeds and then when they, when they poop later, the, the seeds are sticky and they stick to whatever tree the bird is on. So the droppings fall down, stick to a twig, and then what happens is when the little seed germinates, it actually starts forming little semi-roots called historia, and they actually tap into the tree system, and that's where they get their nutrients and their water needs met. Now, mistletoe does do some photosynthesis, so it's not 100% dependent on the tree, but it does hurt the tree a little bit. If there's large numbers of it, it can actually cause quite a problem for the tree. The scientific name for mistletoe is foradendron, which actually means tree thief. And of course, it's stealing nutrients and water from the tree. The word mistletoe comes from two Anglo-Saxon words, mistle and tan. Mistle means dung, tan means twig. So basically mistletoe is dung on a twig, which that's where birds poop out the seeds on the stick. So poop on a stick, dung on a twig, that's where mistletoe gets its name. So the next time you go kiss under it, just think about that. Hi there, I'm Ray Campbell. I'm an ambassador at the Botanic Garden at Oklahoma State, and here are your tips for the garden for November. In your lawn and turf area, now's the time to fertilize cool season grasses such as fescue using one pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet. Also continue to mow fescue as needed at two inches and water during dry conditions. Also now's the time to begin controlling broadleaf winter weeds such as dandelions. Check our fact sheet HLA6601. And finally, keep falling leaves off fescue, especially newly seeded fescue, to avoid damage and smothering to the foliage. Your tree and shrub tips in the garden for November are the following. You can now prune bleeder trees like maples, elms, and birch in the early part of winter. Prune only for structural and safety purposes. Wrap young, thin bark trees with a commercial protective material to prevent winter scald. Now's the time to also apply dormant oil for scale infested trees and shrubs, doing this before the temperatures fall below 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Be sure to follow label directions as with all pesticides. And finally, in your, for trees and shrubs, you can continue to plant bald and burlap trees water thoroughly after planting. Here are some tips for the flowers in your landscape. Tulips and other spring flowering bulbs can still be planted successfully through mid-November. Be sure to leave foliage on asparagus, mums, and other perennials as this will help insulate crowns from harsh winter conditions. In the fruit and nut orchard, delay pruning fruit trees until next February or March, just before bud break. You may also harvest pecans and walnuts, or should harvest pecans and walnuts immediately after falling to eliminate deterioration of the kernels. And finally, some miscellaneous tips in the garden for fall, and particularly in November that you may want to be doing. Gather and shred leaves, add to compost, use as a mulch, or grind and till into garden plots. Clean and store garden landscape tools. Coat with a light application of oil to prevent rusting. Be sure to drain fuel tanks in your small equipment, irrigation lines, and hoses, and be sure to disconnect hoses from outside faucets before freezes. Bring hoses indoors to prevent winter freezing. Fall is a beautiful time in Oklahoma and especially in the gardens. 
Now that leaves are beginning to turn, be sure to get out and enjoy our beautiful fall foliage color. Drive through the mountains or drive through the prairies or just visit a botanic garden in your area. I'm sure you will get a great deal of enjoyment out of seeing the foliage in Oklahoma this fall. I'm Ray Campbell, Ambassador at the Botanic Garden at OSU. Hey, good morning. Uh, my name is Josh Massey, and I'm the superintendent here at the Cimarron Valley Research Station in Perkins. Uh, we're working today on harvesting sweet potatoes, and this sweet potato harvest is part of a project that we are really looking at uh, the cover crops that are grown and trying to look at soil conditions and look at soil health parameters uh, as related to those cover crops, hoping that those cover crops will help improve our soil health. Uh, the sweet potato portion of it is one portion of it. Other things we look at are uh, aggregate stability of the soil, uh, water infiltration of the soil. Uh, we also look at uh, microbial, soil microbial populations within the soil, seeing how those change between the different cover crops that we're using. Now for the summer cover crops, we have a, uh, a uh, pearl millet and cowpea mix. We have a forage cowpea cover and we have a sorghum sudan grass cover. And then we have a fallow cover with that's just kept clean to kind of be our control plot there. Uh, so we rotate these cover crops through fall and, uh, and summer cover crops. And then we harvest our sweet potatoes. We also have a cowpea harvest and we've tried to do a spinach harvest, which hasn't been that successful, but we are hoping to get some good data uh, off these sweet potatoes that are coming out now. Uh, if you're growing sweet potatoes, it's always kind of good to have a little raised bed to put them on. That helps a lot with uh, airflow through there to keep disease down and water infiltration uh, to be able to uh, have a good water flow for those potatoes to, to take that up. Today at the Mother's Garden just outside the Atherton Hotel and it's almost time to start harvesting those peanuts. Now if you've never grown peanuts, peanuts is a fun crop to grow as it's a little bit different. What it does is it puts down these pegs um, off of the flowers down into the ground and that's where the peanut will actually grow underground. They're not like some of our other nuts that grow on trees, they do grow underground. And so it's about time to start digging these as we get closer and closer to frost. And what you'll find is some of these, they'll continue to peg as long as they can continue to grow, but you're gonna to wanna to harvest these, pull them out, and allow them to dry before you, or cure before you actually eat them. Now, just like our produce has changed over the season, as the cooler temperatures come in, it's time to start harvesting that out of the garden, whether it's sweet potatoes or some of those last minute peppers. Just like the produce that we're harvesting has changed through the season, our recipes are also going to be changing. And Barbara Brown is here with a solution for a recipe that combines two ingredients that you might not think about pairing. The 
today I'm doing peanut butter stew. Now this is something you can use with ingredients you've purchased or raised or have stockpiled in your pantry uh, and need to rotate out because uh, any emergency may be down the line. You want to make sure that that food stays fresh. So I'm going to start with a cup of instant brown rice. Now you could use rice that you're going to cook, but you may have to fiddle a little bit with the amount of liquid that you add uh, because this is going to absorb less. Uh, then I'm going to add two cups of chicken broth. This could be another type of broth as well, whatever you happen to have on hand. I wouldn't go as far as using just water though, or you're going to lose a lot of flavor. Also to this, I'm going to add a fourth of a cup of minced onion and a clove of garlic that's been minced or a teaspoon of commercially chopped garlic. Uh, you could also use dried garlic if you wanted to. And if you needed to, you could also use dehydrated onion. It just won't have quite as good of a flavor to it. I'm going to add a half a teaspoon of ground ginger, an eighth of a teaspoon of cayenne pepper or red pepper, and a half a teaspoon of salt. This is kosher salt, so if you're using regular salt, you might want to cut that back. You could also cut it back and let it uh, be added at the end when you taste it to see how the seasoning is going. And then I've got a can of diced tomatoes, or you could use whole tomatoes or a pint of tomatoes that you canned yourself and then about two cups of sweet potato. Now this is when the question comes in on how long the cooking time will be. You notice I've cut it into a little bit of a larger chop. Uh, so if you wanted it to cook faster, I would probably cut them in about half that size. Those are gonna go in there as well. And then we're going to bring this all to a boil and then reduce the heat and cover it and let it simmer for about 10 minutes. So basically we're going to give it time for the rice to cook and most of the potato to be cooked. Because my potatoes are larger, it may take 15 to 20 minutes. So before you go on to the next step, check it for the potato tenderness. All right, we're going to stir together a half a cup of creamy peanut butter and one and a quarter cups of milk. Now I use a whisk because these are two things that don't naturally want to blend really well and I kind of start out a little bit slow. You can use whatever kind of milk you have. You notice this one's a little bit yellower. This is non-fat dry milk uh, that's been rehydrated and if that's what you're trying to rotate out of your house, uh, then you need to uh, rehydrate it early enough that the flavors have, have time. The sugar in milk does not blend back well, does not go into solution well. So if you can leave it overnight at least in the refrigerator and then if you're just going to drink it, make sure you drink it really cold, uh, that will help. But those things will give the sugar time to uh, blend back. Uh, the non-fat dry milk keeps for a long time uh, until you open it and then the keeping time is much shorter. So you can see uh, once it starts to age, it starts to turn a little bit yellower, uh, which is when you want to want to make sure you use it and using it in something like this where uh, the flavors are going to be a little bit more disguised uh, and the color is going to be disguised uh, is going to be to your advantage. So I've checked and our sweet potatoes were tender. So I'm going to turn this up just a little bit. Uh, we're going to let this cook together for about five minutes. So blend it in well. Uh, give it about five more minutes, but you don't need to cover it at this point. Uh, in part because when you cover milk, it tends to uh, build up. Uh, but also uh, because uh, you want to keep an eye on everything here. And, and we're no longer trying to cook the rice, which was uh, the point of keeping the lid on it to begin with. So about five minutes. Remember, you would have checked the sweet potatoes to make sure they were done before you did this because there's not a lot of cooking time left and you don't want the milk itself to have to, to uh, cook very long. You can see that it's thickened up nicely as a stew. Uh, however, my issue with it at this point is it's just not very pretty. So we're gonna add some green to it in the form of about three cups, uh, three to four cups of coarsely chopped baby spinach. You can use other spinach as well. Uh, you're just going to need to remove the stems before you uh, put it in. You could also use frozen spinach if you've dehydrated or 
thawed it and then uh, squeezed some of the juice out. Because it's a soup, it's not essential that it be as squeezed dry as it is for some of the other things that we do. This we're gonna let cook for about three to four minutes just until the spinach is nice and wilted and then it's gonna be done. Okay, you can see this has definitely become a nice stew. It's got a lot of color. It's full of nutrition, full of flavor. I think you're really gonna like this one. I'm gonna sprinkle it with a little bit of green onion, just to give it a little bit more color, and then a few chopped peanuts. Give it a little bit more texture. I hope you'll like it. It's peanut butter stew for Oklahoma Gardening. I'm Barbara Brown. Next week, we'll shelter some tender perennials indoors for the winter. Justin Moss will have a cool tool for the garden. We'll craft a concrete sphere. There'll be more plant relationships and another tasty treat. We wish you health and wellness, and we'll see you next week for more Oklahoma Gardening. To find out more information about show topics, as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure and visit our website, oklamagardening.okstate.edu. And we always have great information, answers to questions, photos, and gardening discussions on your favorite social media as well. Join in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows, as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. And tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater Jewel. We would like to thank our generous underwriter, the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is also provided by Pond Pro Shop, Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, the Oklahoma Horticultural Society, and the Tulsa Garden Club.